All right, so we're going to be talking about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. ADHD was not well known or well studied in children until the 1990s. It was first called attention deficit disorder in 1980, but the medical community has known of such children since a Lancet article was published back in 1902 and the literary community has described such children for almost 200 years. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Fidgety Phil and Hans Stare in the Air, two characters in a book called Struel Peter uh, that was written in German and translated into English by Mark Twain back in 1845. Mark Twain lived with his family in Germany for several years and he supported the family by doing these translations. So here's the book, it's called Slovenly Peter. And here we have Hans, uh, I mean, Fidgety Phil. And you can see at the bottom, there's a poem there. And it's, it's remarkable to me that Mark Twain could take German, a German poem and translate it into English so that it still rhymed. Um, and here we have Fidgety Phil with his family at the table. Oop, oop, oop. And there we go. Also, Hans stare in the air. And more Hans stare in the air. After I had discovered this book, a colleague let me know about it. I went back and reread the first chapter of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. And Huckleberry Finn was clearly active and restless and impulsive and probably inattentive, but that's harder to tease out in, in at least the beginning of that story. Now, the, the syndrome has shifted from brain to behavior to cognition. So in the 50s, it was considered minimal brain damage or minimal brain dysfunction. Then in 1968, hyperkinetic reaction, basically behavior. And then since 1980, the focus has been on attention and difficulties with attention. Now, what is ADHD? It has these three core symptoms, inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. It needs to persist for at least, at least six months. The symptoms need to occur in two or more settings. Generally, that's home and school. And most important, the symptoms have to impact social, academic, or other functioning. Now, it's important to, to note that the combined type that includes all three of the symptoms is much more common in boys, where the inattentive type that is just inattention is much more common in girls. Um, age is also important. Hyperactivity decreases over years. So when I'm talking to parents about this, uh, when they first learn their child has ADHD, we talk about over time that hyperactivity will settle down. However, the inattention persists and the impulsivity is somewhere in between decreasing some, but usually not going away. Why is ADHD so important? Well, the, the most common chronic illnesses in children and adolescents in the US are asthma, obesity, and ADHD. I, I don't think very many people are aware of that, but ADHD is at near the top of the list for chronic illnesses in children. Only about 60% of patients with ADHD get medical care. To me, that's unforgivable. Uh, but those numbers are real, and those numbers have been relatively steady um, over the last several years based on uh, government data. 
And the academic, social, and emotional consequences are substantial. Now, this is a very long list, and I don't want this to, to kind of put you to sleep here, but I want to walk through these because they are so important. So during childhood, reduced school performance, social rejection. Peers will often shun kids who are too active and impulsive, and conduct problems in adolescence. During adulthood, things get worse. Antisocial personality disorder in some adults, subsequent substance use disorders, poor occupational performance, higher probability of unemployment, elevated interpersonal conflict. Marriages are, are often affected, as well as relationships within families and at work. Unplanned pregnancy and increased motor vehicle accidents. I mean, that is, to me, quite a list of consequences. And you would think this would be almost like a public health emergency. Look at all those potential problems. What causes ADHD? Well, genetic factors and non-genetic factors. And I've just listed a few of the non-genetic factors. Smoking during pregnancy leads to vasoconstriction of arteries that supply blood to vital brain structures that are developing during pregnancy. Drugs, alcohol is an important one. There's a syndrome you probably know called fetal alcohol syndrome. And the core symptoms of fetal alcohol syndrome include hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattention. Lead and other pollutants, and then social environmental factors, stresses of poverty, racism, et cetera. So a lot of non-genetic factors. But genetic factors are much more important than I think most of us had appreciated. If you look at this graph, age goes across the bottom of the graph and the percent of heritability across the um, vertical axis. And you see the, um, the line that's sort of purple at the top, that's ADHD. And so about two thirds of the um, cause is genetic heritability. The blue line is for anxiety. This data is 15 years old. I think newer data suggests that line's too high. I don't think it goes up that high. And if you think about another disorder in childhood, autism, its heritability line looks almost identical to that for ADHD. So they're both have very important genetic vulnerabilities. And then what about comorbidity with other disorders? If you look at the left graph here, for kids who don't have ADHD, the percentage of those with all these different disorders is very low. If you look at the right half, children with ADHD, learning disabilities, conduct disorders, anxiety, depression, speech problems, autism, hearing problems, epilepsy, seizures, vision problems, and Tourette syndrome. Substantial rates. Um, here, I just want to make the point that the inattention, the distraction in ADHD is to things that are external. So here you see a young person sitting at a table and there's all this stuff going on in the room that's grabbing this person's attention. Where on the right, you have uh, someone who is anxious and all the stuff is internal. Am I doing this right? Am I doing anything right? What is my life's purpose? Am I happy? Internal thoughts. Now, because of comorbidity, there's a substantial number of children that have both external and internal anxiety, and that can really be a struggle. What about treatments for ADHD? Well, school invent interventions, as you probably all know, are important, IEPs or 504 plans. And ADHD by itself doesn't qualify a child for an IEP or a 504 plan. But if the ADHD is causing learning problems, it does qualify. And it's very unusual 
for ADHD to not cause some learning problems. And I might note here, there are several clinics in Maryland that are set up to provide free legal advice to families that are struggling with getting their children the services they need. I know one of them that's a very good one is at the Kennedy Krieger Institute uh, in Baltimore, but there are several others. And that can be very important if the school is not hearing the message about my child needs help. And then behavior management training for caregivers. And this is just really simple stuff, reinforcing positive behavior, ignoring selected negative behavior, and then making changes based on success or not with a therapist. And behavior management training has been shown in so many studies to be very effective and helpful. And then medication. And we really have primarily two kinds of medication that we think about, the stimulants, two types, methylphenidate and amphetamine, brain names you may recognize, Ritalin or Adderall, and then the alpha agonists, guanfacine and clonidine, and two types, uh, brand names, Intunib and Capvate, and then combination. I'm very excited about combination treatment, um, and, and that's because the FDA um, approved the combination of stimulants and alpha agonists for the treatment of ADHD just a couple of years ago. And I do a lot of BHIP consulting to primary care clinicians, and we're making that recommendation more and more. In just in this month's uh, issue of the Journal of, of um, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, there was a very good article by a very good group of researchers that I've worked with before at UCLA that showed that the combination of a stimulant and an alpha agonist is not just additive, but synergistic, that the two together do more than A plus B equals A plus B. And they also, uh, in some ways, substantiated that uh, with uh, uh, electrophysiology studies showing which pathways in the brain became more active. And one of them that I think was the most obvious was working memory, which is so important for learning. So school interventions, behavior management training, and medication are the treatments. Why is ADHD advocacy so important? Well, first, because ADHD is easy to identify, assess, and treat. And treatments can be provided that are readily available in primary care practices and schools that are time effective and cost effective. And I'm gonna make a comment here. This is just my own thought and not representing any organizational whatever. Um, we have been trying to get the state to approve a pilot program that would provide funding for primary care clinicians, again, in a pilot program, to provide assessment and treatment of ADHD. And we still haven't convinced them of that. There are concerns about, will it take business away from other providers? Will it uh, spare the insurance companies of having to pay for what they should be paying for, et cetera? But um, that figure we saw in an earlier slide where only 60% of children get medical care could be changed a lot if there was funding to pay for the time it takes to really take care of a child and family. And hopefully, um, what you all are doing here today and the advocacy that can come from all this will lead to fewer fidgety fills and fewer Hans stare in the airs. And that is the end of my talk. <laughs>